This session is miniaturization with Jason Larson. <laughs> so. Yes, so everybody, uh, everybody is off watching Bruce Snyder. Oh. <laughs> Except for you, uh, uh, you great people. So if you don't know, I'm Jason Larson. I'm a cybersecurity researcher, and I studied the critical infrastructure. So for the last few years, I've been uh, <clears throat> um, studying remote physical damage. And so uh, I've got an, a series of experiments that I'm, I'm working on, and this is actually the, the results of the first stage of the experiment. So it takes a little bit of background to understand uh, uh, kind of what I'm doing. So um, this is kind of my experimental setup. Um, so we basically have a water pipe. And if any of you have ever been in a house and you uh, kicked off the, uh, the faucet, and then like half a second later you hear a thunk from some other part of the house, it's actually a water hammer. You close the, the valve too fast, and a pressure wave starts building up behind as all the water crashes into the valve and runs off until it finds some surface, an elbow or something that moves, and that's where you hear the, uh, hear the thunk. So water hammers um, in industrial processes are much, uh, uh, much larger and damage a bunch of stuff. Um, so the water hammer effect is actually pretty well known um, uh, in that if you, you close the valve, uh, you slam the valve, valve closed fast enough, then uh, the pressure wave runs out at the speed of sound in the liquid. So the speed of sound in water is like 1,400 meters a second. It's really fast. It's faster than a bullet. So obviously, the you know couple of tons of water you have in this pipe isn't going to get up and move at the speed of, bullet, uh, speed of a bullet that way. So there's actually a much slower wave that forms. So there's actually some steam bubbles that form right at the surface of the valve when it closes. And the steam bubbles push out, and they push the water. And this mass movement of water is, is based on this uh, um, the, the expansion of steam steam. So the, the actual pressure wave, the slower movement, mass movement water wave is, is, is slower. It's also a lot harder to, uh, to predict. So it's going to uh, it's gonna run out and hit it and reflect and reflect back. So if you actually uh, are sitting there and you crack the valve at the right time, when you crack the valve and you close it again, you can create a second pressure wave. And so the first pressure wave comes over there and it, uh, hits the second pressure wave and you get waveform addition. So the pressure wave gets bigger and bigger. So in this piping structure, then you can come over there and basically make this pressure wave bigger and bigger like pushing a swing. So the more times you cycle it, the bigger it gets until eventually something in this uh, thing is gonna, gonna fail. The valve's gonna go out, the elbows are gonna die. Something's gonna die in this, uh, in this situation. But since the, uh, the speed of this uh, slower moving wave is really hard to predict, then um, you can't really uh, sit there and study the, the things like, okay, that's 62 inches long, and that's this big, and that's big, and do a bunch of calculations and actually come anywhere close to it. But you can actually observe it. So a lot of times, thankfully for the attacker, then there's sensors in all of your piping structures. And so a lot of times you'll find a, a pressure sensor or flow meter or something like that that's actually sitting there, and actually it can actually observe the wave. So if you have a, a pressure sensor somewhere in this uh, structure with the valve, and you close the valve really fast, and this, uh, this wave goes by, then you have the time x from when the valve closes until you actually see the, see the first wave. It's going to come out, reflect, and come back, and you're going to see it. So the round trip time from the reflection back is y. And then you can have the time from the, uh, the sensor back to the valve that's x. So the whole round trip time from the valve to the elbow and back is going to just going to be 2x plus y. So if you have a sensor and you can just sit there and you can see the, the incident wave, you can see the reflected wave, you actually figure out how fast uh, you need to uh, sit there and cycle the valve to get this pressure, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, pressure wave to get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually turn something into a pretzel or blow out a seal or whatever's going to happen to the system. So unfortunately, this wave goes by pretty fast. Um, so I've got an experimental setup that's about 60 feet long, and when I uh, close the uh, valve and the um, the wave goes there and back, it's, uh, it takes less than a second. But a lot of times on these sensors, you only really sample them at a much, a much slower frequency. So you've got the pressure sensor and you say, hey, give me some pressure. And you might do that at, uh, at a second or maybe a couple of times a second. But this isn't fast enough to actually see this wave go by and see the wave come back. But the uh, microcontroller on the, the sensors are capable of sampling faster. So if you actually come on and get code execution, on the, uh, on the actual pressure sensor itself, then uh, you can come out there and find that analog pin and say, sample, sample, sample. And a lot of these will go really fast. Uh, so uh, most of the analog inputs on the microtor are set up to do 44 kilohertz so they can do, um, they can do uh, um, human audio. 
So um, if you can actually come over there and squish down your code into something small enough that can get onto uh, uh, that can get onto this pressure sensor and detect the wave for you, if the the uh, physics are there, um, the microcontrol is possible to do it. You just need to squish your code down small enough. Um, but unfortunately, the small microcontrollers are uh, um, are actually um, really really small. So a lot of these are MSP430s, Atmel AVRs, um, some old Hitachi CPUs, and, and stuff like that. So uh, most of the flash on those are already full. So you've got a, a microcontroller with only kilo, uh, kilobytes of memory, very little CPU power, um, uh, and uh, they're all actually kind of a little bit fragile. So um, the first stage of my experiment was basically, uh, can I actually miniaturize some code down enough that I can do all the processing necessary to, uh, uh, to extract the, the round trip time of that wave into a very small microcontroller? So the second stage of the experiment is actually um, what we're working on right now, which is we're building a, a full-scale mock-up, and we're actually going to run this to that. And the third stage of the experiment is, uh, is actually what I wanted to test, uh, test all along, and that's uh, place shifting a chemical reaction out of a reaction vessel and into a piping structure. So normally up on a, uh, up on a hill, you have your big tanks of chemicals. The chemicals come down into reaction vessels, uh, and they're properly mixed in the appropriate ratios. You heat them up until they start reacting. Um, and things are supposed to go bad in that reaction vessel. There's pressure relief valves and cash basins and everything. So what I really wanted to test was, um, can we actually take the, um, uh, take the contents of that reaction vessel that's unreacted, slide it into a, some piping structures, and then add, um, then cause, a, uh, cause the water hammer effect to actually add the extra energy necessary to start off the chemical reaction and make the chemical reaction happen someplace else. So I submitted two presentations to Black Hat. Um, so one was uh, the algorithms that uh, uh, I used to miniaturize down the, uh, uh, the detection routines uh, so that they can actually uh, be as small as possible. And the second part was how to efficiently merge firmware, um, merge my rootkit into the firmware. So Black Hat uh, approved both my presentations and then told me I had a one hour time slot to do both presentations. And so this is going to be really fast and a kind of a high level overview. So, uh, um, so if I'm uh, losing anybody, give me a little you know, slow down, thumbs down, because I'm going to run through this a little bit on the fast side. So the first thing we actually need to do um, when we're uh, uh, looking at this is the obvious thing. We need to actually spot the, uh, um, spot the wave and the, uh, um, and the counter wave. And so I'm going to run through just uh, why easy approaches won't work to, to illustrate kind of what's going on here. So the first thing everybody tries to do is a moving average. So this is uh, um, some data off of a Tennessee Eastman process that I got from a, uh, from a colleague. And there's some noise in the data. So you have to deal with the noise. So if you're going to say, like, oh, I'll just run the moving average over the top of this thing, it'll make it all work out. So if you do a two-point moving average, it doesn't uh, smooth it out enough, and you're going to detect these peaks like 50 times. But you only need like four bytes to store the data. So if you come over there and you crank this thing up to a 50-point moving average, uh, then uh, you know the spikies are kind of mostly gone. Um, but uh, now you need 200 bytes just to store the uh, the history for your moving average. If you go all the way up to um, uh, whoops. Oh. So if you go up to, all the way up to, um, uh, to 200 points, I'm missing, actually missing a slide there. If you go all the way up to a 200 point moving average, then everything starts looking good um, uh, and everything's nice and smooth. Uh, but at that point, you need 800 bytes just to, uh, just to store the history of the moving average. And since we're only going to have a couple of kilobytes to actually build our entire rootkit, um, these types of things are really way too big uh, to stick in there. Um, also, a uh, moving average is a, is a scale-dependent algorithm. So if I want to know how, how big of a moving average I'm going to have to, to do to actually smooth out this waveform, then uh, um, I have to know what the, the signal looks like. So if the signal was really, really noisy, I might need you know, a 1,000 uh, sample moving average. If it's all, already really clean, I might not only need a few uh, of them. So this is scale-dependent, meaning that I have to have pre-knowledge of the, the signal before I can write my algorithm. So we can actually uh, um, come over there and just instead of doing things like moving averages, we can uh, fit curves to, the, to it. Unfortunately, all of your uh, um, fast Fourier transform curve fitting stuff is just, um, it's just not going to work. You're never going to get a fast Fourier transform library down into just a couple of, uh, couple of K worth of memory. 
So what you can do is you can actually match a set of line segments on top of the, uh, on top of the data. So if you uh, look at the process uh, data and you look at a set of line segments and you match a set of line segments over the top, this actually gives you a pretty good estimation of, uh, of what's going on in the process. Um, triangles are, uh, um, looking at a series of triangles is actually really cheap and easy and, uh, and easy to calculate. You can just do a few divides and you're there. So we need a, actually need an algorithm to stretch over the top of that. And so I'm not going to run over, uh, I'm just going to throw this up there and just describe how this algorithm works. So to do uh, the actual triangle matching and get it really, really, really small, you basically start at, uh, at a point and you start taking, you, you uh, project two slopes up over the, the top of the data. Um, and the two slopes go out and then you, uh, every time you find a point that's, uh, that's above the top slope, you rotate the two slopes upwards. And every time you find a point that's below the uh, two, you rotate the slope uh, downward. And you keep doing that until you find X number of points that are above and below the, uh, the two slopes of the line. And uh, when you hit that number, then you declare um, a vertex of the line segment. And then you just figure out, uh, um, you have the new vertex, and then you take a look at it and say, is this, uh, um, is this uh, triangle bigger or smaller in terms of length than the previous triangles? So if, it was, uh, um, so if it's a really long triangle, then that means that uh, you've got too big of an angle between your two slopes. And so as the slopes come up, you'd narrow the angle a little bit. If it's a really short one, then that means you're detecting too much of the noise and you crank it out a little bit. So you can actually miniaturize this, uh, this algorithm down, uh, down to where you can do the whole thing in about, uh, in about eight subtracts, two divides, and three compares. And so you can get it really, really, really small. So this is, uh, again, that Tennessee Eastman data with a set of triangles matched over the top of it. So now we have this nice approximation of what's going on. One of the nice things about doing it this way is when I want to do the, the heavyweight processing, we only actually have to run the heavyweight processing logics uh, at the vertex of the triangle. So when I'm coming over there and saying, like, is this actually the, uh, the peak of a wave, I only have to do this, uh, um, do this math right at the individual peaks of the, uh, of the triangles. So now we just need to go extract the, uh, the wave and the counter wave. And so if we're looking at this, this is actually some data off of uh, some sensors in the, in the uh, sea, of, sea of Japan. So right there, a sensor glitch happened. Um, uh, so uh, uh, me and a friend of mine have a lot of debate about what happened in this, uh, this uh, sensor glitch. But if you go look at where the, uh, the sensor glitch is, right after that, the slopes of the lines change, the length of the lines change. And uh, um, that actually tells us something, uh, something uh, different happened. So we can take this approach and uh, try and extract both uh, X, which is the time uh, between when we close the valve and the first pressure wire showed up, and Y, the round trip time, to uh, get the optimal water hammer um, timing. It also has the uh, added ability that when we're starting to stretch things over there, um, uh, we, uh, our algorithm isn't scale dependent. So we don't really care once we get onto the top of the sensor and we start looking at this data coming off this analog pin. We don't really care if this is in centimeters of water, millimeters of mercury, pascals, or just whatever they came up with. We can just stretch it over. So if we're looking at this, this is uh, what the actual model. So there's a chunk of modeling software they use in industrial uh, control systems to figure out, you know, have I built a big enough pipe so when this thing slams close, the, the transient is going to go here. And so the top one is actually what was predicted by the model. When, uh, when the uh, valve uh, slams close, then this is the pressure you should actually uh, get to see. So if you look at the bottom one, the bottom one is actually what, uh, what was uh, returned off the sensor. And the two of them aren't really that close. So uh, we actually need some way to extract that data in both cases. But just looking at the data here, we can actually see our answer in the, uh, in the lower data. So if we start the, the valve open hap happens at about time point, um, uh, time point four tenths of a second. Um, the, uh, the valve close happens at uh, about, uh, um, about uh, 0.55. Um, and the, uh, um, the return wave actually happens, or the instant wave happens at 0.55, and the return wave uh, shows up at about 0.56. So if we did just do 2x plus y, we know that in my, uh, um, in my test setup with a 60-foot uh, pipe, then when I slam it closed, then four tenths of a second later, the, the shock wave is going to reflect off the end and show back up over on the beginning. So when we uh, take a look at that, we uh, stretch a series of line segments over the top of uh, this noisy data. We need some way to come over there and say, are these the ones that we have? Is this just some random you know, generator kicking on or uh, the chiller kicked over or something like that, some, some normal uh, disturbance? 
So the way I actually sat down and extracted um, the, the actual waveforms in a, in a scale-free manner is I just converted the actual lines uh, to a triangle strip. So you, can, uh, so you, you view all the line segments as a triangle strip. And actually for um, pressure transients, the ratio of the areas between adjacent triangles and the triangle strips is actually fairly constant. So even in all the noisy data and stuff, if you just come over there and take each triangle and say the first triangle has an area of one, if the second triangle is somewhere in the, 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 the range of, of uh, 0.86 and the uh, times 0.86 the size of the second one, and the third one is point, about 0.61, then this is actually, a, uh, um, this is actually the, the event that we're looking for. So we only have to run uh, the, the actual uh, line segment stretching uh, on each individual point. Then when we get vertexes, we just take a look at each vertex, look in the vertex history, which we only have to have three points of history, and uh, we can look to see that we've actually grabbed this. There's, there's an upside to this in that uh, this is, uh, uh, the ratios are really opaque. So if uh, um, Ralph Wagner or somebody else is reverse engineering your code and they see these ratios in your code, it's not obvious that uh, you're trying to exploit a, uh, a water hammer and get the pressure to build. So we get this down to, uh, um, to fit into pressure sensor and it weighs in at about 700 bytes, which is kind of an ouch when you only have a couple of kilobytes to deal with, but it, uh, but it works. So the next thing we've got to do is, uh, um, is, is uh, actually spoof the operator. So we're going to come over here and we're going to be cycling the valve and, uh, and causing pipes to jump and things to fail. We don't really want the operator to, uh, to see all this stuff going on. So this is, uh, this is actually uh, um, uh, kind of classically how, uh, how um, we would do this. This is uh, some old data from 11 years ago um, when we were running some experiments. In this case, we hacked into a, uh, um, a scale chemical process and made a bunch of uh, um, tanks overflow, and then we hacked into uh, an electric power substation and, and kicked it off. But in both cases, this is taking kind of the classic approach of um, we just, uh, when we did the spoof, is we just recorded the, recorded the data for a while, and after we recorded enough of the data, we said, hey, operator, here's some more of the same data that we recorded for you. And, uh, and we can spoof it and say, this is kind of the, uh, just the standard way everybody, uh, everybody kind of does it. But we can't really use this approach because we're we want to sit in a pressure sensor, and we got like 2K of memory, so maybe we could record like one second of power data um, inside this thing, or one second of pressure data, but that's about it. So we need an actual better approach. So, uh, um, so the first thing that we have to do in our spoof is uh, we have to start transferring uh, all of these uh, random disturbances. So when the forensics guys come in and they're looking at all the data, they actually use these disturbances to, to, to marry up all the stuff and trying to build a picture of what happened when inside the process. So if you come over here and here's your sensor and it's just perfect, it's perfectly flat and there's no uh, disturbances in it uh, whatsoever, when everybody else is seeing all this stuff uh, um, fly around, then you're not going to be able to see the, uh, um, they're, they're not going to believe that this is actual real sensor data. So what we need to do is take this overall trend um, where we're manipulating the data and take all the disturbances and then actually reflect them back onto the original data. But we can actually use the, uh, use the triangles that we built earlier to, to accomplish this. So here we have uh, some lines fit over the top of this particular one with a disturbance um, where the chiller kicks on. And all we have to do is move the mid-segment, uh, mid-section of each line back up onto a flat, flat line and just take all the deltas and push them back up. And we now have a nice, um, a nice flat line that's believable to the operator um, that has all the disturbances. So when all the other sensors see things going on, this sensor is going to see things going on as well. So we also have, a, we have one more problem that we have to do before we can actually get the spoofing done. Um, and so uh, this problem is the actual sensor noise. So humans are actually pretty good at looking at sensor noise and seeing when things change. So if we come over here and we've got a bunch of data and we just say, hey, everything goes flatline, everybody's going to look at that and say, like, yeah, there's, there's a dead sensor here. This isn't right. The forensic team is going to zone, uh, zone in on what you're doing, and then they're going to find all your stuff, and you know, you're going to be unhappy. So you can use a series of things with uh, shifting and uh, scaling to try and regenerate sensor noise. So, uh, but if you shift things up, if you shift every point onto the line, obviously you're going to make a straight line. So you have to shift things in blocks, and uh, the blocks start, uh, start giving you these stair step patterns. And uh, if you just scale things, then sensors uh, don't have the same dynamic, uh, the same noise over their whole dynamic range. So some of them have a little bit of noise up here, and then as they go by, they have bigger noise, et cetera. So if you take a little bit of noise down here, and you scale it up, you start getting really, really large uh, chunks of noise. So we need a better way to regenerate sensor noise. 
So uh, um, if we just add a bunch of randomness and try and fake it, then humans are going to see something like this. Here's, here's your sensor noise um, that goes along, and then here's something totally different. So humans zone in on kind of the spikiness, the widthiness, and um, the gaps that are going on there to see if it's actually the same. So if you're a math major, you say, yay, fast forward your transform. All I'll do is I'll take all the frequencies of the noise signal, and I'll propagate them, uh, propagate them out forever. Um, so, but your FFT library isn't going to fit in this couple of kilobytes we've got on this, uh, this sensor. So I actually came up with an algorithm, this variant of uh, runs analysis, which is used in statistics to compare two pseudorandom routines to see if those two pseudorandom routines um, are actually somewhat the same. And so the algorithm is actually really simple. So what you do is you take your input data and you, and you count the number of runs that are increasing in a row. So if, uh, if the data is increasing and the noise is increasing, uh, say, five times in a row, you put plus, in, plus one into the plus five, uh, plus five bucket, and then you figure out how much uh, it actually moved in that plus five. So this moved 100. So you add 100 to the, uh, to the total. And then if it decreases three times in a row, then you say, plus one into the, to the minus three bucket, and it moved 25, so we add 20, uh, 25 to the minus three. So after you sample for a little bit, this actually produces this nice normal distribution like you expect in any random sampling. So you have uh, the random distributions of them, and then you also have um, a set of line segments. So if we've added a bunch of stuff to the plus five bucket, we know on average how, how far the plus five bucket moved. So if we count them up and we take those line segments, we can actually uh, come down and start chaining together um, pluses and minuses line segments and start reproducing the sensor noise. And we can reproduce um, um, really accurate sensor noise. So then we just sample from the, uh, uh, which ones are gonna do based on the, uh, um, the normal distribution. So we throw a random number, we pick from either a positive bucket if we wanna go up or a negative bucket if we wanna go down, and we chain together those line segments. And that actually gives us um, um, really believable sensor noise without uh, pre-knowledge of what's happening on the sensor and a wide variety of algorithms. So here we have the uh, sensor data. This is more Sea of Japan sensor data, um, where uh, the first part of the data down through this, the, the whoosh is actually the real data. And as a human, you go, okay, there's real data there. And it's all nice and spiky and gappy and everything. And all the rest of the, the, the rest of the data there is actually generated programmatically off of the, off of the uh, um, the noise, and uh, as you can see, it has the same spike characteristics and gap characteristics, and to a human, it's actually going to look um, look really good. So after we've uh, implemented this algorithm, um, we can get it down to about 400 bytes, um, plus or minus, depending on how we do the insertion. So uh, um, that'll definitely fit in our pressure sensor. So now that we have, uh, have all this code, so we can, uh, we can smack the valve closed, we can see the uh, shockwave come out, we can detect the shockwave, we can figure out X and Y, um, and we can generate um, uh, nearly perfect sensor noise and transfer all the artifacts back there. Our total payload after we squish all this stuff down is about, uh, about 2,100 bytes. So we're about 2K of data to pull off this whole, uh, um, this whole attack. That's about 7 tenths of a percent of the entire flash. So what we have to do now is actually um, insert, it in, insert this uh, code into the firmware efficiently. And so uh, um, this is going to start jumping into uh, a bunch of assembly stuff. So if assembly bores you, then now is a good time for popcorn. Um, <laughs> so I need to... Uh, um, I need to insert, insert it efficiently, but I also need to debug it. So in my test setup, uh, then the valve at the end of this thing costs about 5,000 bucks, and I've already destroyed one of them. And so whenever you come over there and you say, ah, oh, I ran a bunch of code on your, uh, on, on your machine, and now I just destroyed a $5,000 valve, can I please have another one? Then your boss looks at you and goes, hmm, I don't know if you can have another one. So you want your code to be really, really, really accurate and, uh, and, and debugged. And so what I needed was some way to code up all my rootkit on my trusty MacBook Pro and debug the snot out of it and make sure it actually really, really, really worked. Um, except since uh, um, the sensor I was using spoke DNP3 and I needed to debug DNP3, then I had to take this DNP3 checksum around those libraries and stick them all onto my MacBook so I could debug them. Except I really want to call the DNP uh, version inside the sensor because that's going to save me space. But the, the version inside the sensor has all these side effects. Um, so it, not only does it uh, calculate the checksum, but it resets the watchdog timer, it updates the performance counter, it does all this other stuff. Um, so what I needed was some way to, uh, uh, to come over there and first um, go find the uh, 
and find the algorithm that matched inside the sensor, and then say, how does this algorithm inside the sensor differ from my algorithm? And then make sure that uh, um, I merged them together in such a way that uh, the algorithm and the sensor behaved my way and not the way it originally did, at least in my context and not uh, their context. So I call this technique parallel construction, except since Snowden uh, um, released a bunch of stuff and said parallel construction means, uh, um, means making up data for the FBI, then I have to call it something else. So I'm going to run through an actual example of finding it. So let's just say that uh, um, we've, got, uh, we've got this example code. It's a simple, easy to understand loop that pops down. And so this is the example code that's going to be in the sensor and uh, also on my uh, trusty MacBook Pro. Um, so the first thing you have to do is be able to figure out which of these functions inside the sensor is actually the same one on my, uh, on my MacBook. So um, as an illustration, I've compiled it down for two different architectures here. So the first architecture is an MSP430, and you can see it sets up some arguments, runs around in the loop a little bit, and then returns the arguments back. And so this is the same function that's written in ARM assembly. So we set up the arguments, we run around the loop, and return it back. So structurally, it's really, uh, really the same. Um, but this is an apples to oranges comparison. We can't directly compare MSP430 assembly instructions and ARM assembly instructions. So we need to transform them in some way. But they have uh, the, the same basic structure. They have a preamble, they allocate some stuff on the stack, they set up some uh, um, the zero sum variables until they act to get to the actual logic, then they clean up and they go home. So they have the same, the same types of sections, um, they just have different assembly instructions. So the way I solve this is actually um, by converting new things to microops. So um, uh, an assembly instruction is actually a complex beast. It does more than one thing. So if you do like a push EAX, that's actually a complex instruction. It does two things. It tracks four from the stack pointer, actually moves whatever is an EAX into the uh, pointer that uh, uh, the stack pointer points to. So one of the things that we can do then is we can take both of these assemblies and we can describe them as this in, in the same microop language. Um, so, uh, for instance, a, uh, a subtract a lot of times has a side effect of uh, setting the flags registers. So we can just do a set of microops that says subtract these two things and then check these, uh, these values and set the appropriate flag registers and describe this out as a longer set of microops. So let's go back to the two functions that we have here. The, the bigger one at the top is, uh, is the ARM assembly and the lower one at the bottom is the MSP430 assembly. So we've got... Uh, um, and we've got these two functions that should be the same because they came from the same uh, C code, um, but now I've converted them uh, over into the same microop language. And so we can actually directly compare these instructions now um, because they have, the, uh, they have the, actually the same language. But they're not the same yet, so we need some way to transform them into something, uh, something that's, uh, that's mostly the same. So I actually call this, uh, this transform binary normal form. So uh, what we need is a set of rules that will actually take the ARM, uh, take the, uh, the ARM and the MSP430 assembly and make it so that uh, there's actually only one way to represent the logic. So the binary number form has a set of rules. Um, so one of the rules is that you can't move directly from memory to memory. You have to move from memory to a temporary register and then back out to memory. Um, likewise, there's no um, jumps that are negative. So, so all jump if not equals have to be transformed into jump if equals. So if you take all of these, uh, um, these, these rules and you apply them, uh, apply them over and over to the logic, you normalize the logic. And so here's actually the, uh, the two new assemblies. So we've taken the ARM and the MSP430. We've transformed them both into, uh, um, uh, into the microop language and then uh, applied binary normal form to them. And you can see they mostly kind of match. Um, so they have a lot of the same, same type of logic into them and the temporary registers inserted, except uh, um, it would be really unfortunate if uh, um, we had to match up, the registers had to match, and the compiler had to choose all the same offsets for all the same, uh, same parts of the structures. So uh, uh, in this case, um, here we have register 4 being used for something in the MSP430 and register 11 being used for it over in the ARM assembly. So we need some way to, uh, to take out all the, uh, the stack operations and all the register relocation stuff and turn it uh, actually into uh, something that can be directly compared. And so the last transform is something I call an infinite register file. So what if we had a CPU that had an infinite number of registers? There would be no, no need to allocate things on the stack. There would be no need for a stack um, at all because when you wanted some more, uh, some more space for something, you would just allocate a bunch more registers out of the infinite register file. So in this case, uh, things like... Uh, 
over here um, on the setup, um, there's really no need for a base pointer at all anymore, but you could just move something to a base pointer. Um, if you, instead of allocating on the stack, you could just allocate a few more registers, and instead of having a local variable that you're putting zero into, you just allocate a register and set it to zero. So this is, a, um, this is the actual logic um, uh, in the uh, infinite register file, uh, what the infinite register file applied to it. Uh, so you can see everything gets a whole, a whole lot simpler when we throw out all the stack operations. So since now this, uh, this meta CPU with an infinite stack doesn't need a, uh, the, uh, an infinite number of registers and have a stack, we can directly compare and the logic actually matches. So now if I take, uh, um, if I take my uh, uh, routine that I've coded up on my MacBook Pro and the routine that I got out of the pressure sensor and I uh, take them, I transfer them both into not binary normal form, I can sit there and just walk through and say, do these th two things match so that they, as they should match um, exactly. And so I can go find the, say, the GMP, DNP checksum and both of them match them up. So, uh, um, but let's just say that uh, the version of the software that I, uh, I compiled down on my MacBook isn't exactly the same as the version of the software that's inside the sensor itself. So in this case, let's say I've got uh, um, the same loop that's, uh, that's in there, and I have my evil loop that adds four to it every time it goes around. Um, so these two loops are, are very, very similar, but they're not exact. So what we need to do is have some way that we can go look at it and say, how similar are they? And what are the differences? So in this case, I've got a, say, a check summer inside the, uh, the firmware that has all these side effects. Basically, what I'm asking is, when I merge these two together, what are the side effects? So I can get rid of the side effects. So uh, if we compile them down, we switch them into a uh, normal form. <coughs> then, uh, um, if we compile down and switch them into normal form, this is what they look like. And uh, if we go look at it, then there's actually only a couple of assembly instructions different between the, the first step, uh, second one, the first one and the second one. So one of the ways we can talk about how different they are is to talk about the edit distance between these two functions. So we have function A and function B, and we can actually make these uh, two functions the same function uh, by uh, inserting a single if statement into the, uh, into the assembly. So here we have the first one and the second one. If we insert this if statement, which uh, has another if arg2, so basically uh, up in memory I'm setting a global uh, at the top of when my rootkit is running, I unset it at the bottom of it. So it basically runs out and it touch, uh, checks that global and says, am I executing in the rootkit context? And if it is executing in the rootkit context, then execute my version, otherwise execute the, uh, um, the, the original version of the, uh, of the firmware. Um, so uh, we can come over there and, and, uh, and look at these two functions, but what we really want to know, um, uh, what we really want is uh, um, some way to automate um, finding these functions that are mostly the same, but a little bit different. And we also want to uh, automate how we actually find the blocks that are different between these two functions and then insert a bunch of this statements into them so that we can, uh, we can merge them together. So luckily there's an algorithm that can help. Um, so uh, probably most computer science majors have heard of Needleman Wunsch. What Needleman Wunsch does is it takes two input strings um, and finds the, the closest match between those two input strings. So in this case, we've got uh, um, inserting uh, code is fun and inserting rootkits is fun. And if we, uh, we tell it to go align these two, it, uh, it aligns them uh, like, like is below. So since the first string is shorter, it's got to insert a few spaces into it. To look at it. So these two strings actually have an added distance of two. Um, so uh, if we start comparing the things that match, inserting matches until we get to a section that doesn't match, and so there's the first, uh, the first edit, and then there's a second edit, and everything matches up. We can also calculate an efficiency of the two matches. So uh, in this case, we have 18 characters that are the same and 10 characters are the difference. So we can just divide that up and say, this is, uh, this is so many percent efficient if we actually merge these two things together. So if we take our, our two functions, we've got uh, um, function A and function B, my evil version, then uh, um, what we could do is we can just turn these micro ops into a set of letters. Needleman which doesn't uh, declare an alphabet, just that there's unique letters. So if we just uh, create a transform to take every micro op and then turn it into a letter, um, and then we can generate a string of micro ops after we convert them to normal form, and then we can compare the two of them. So since I do this uh, all nice and, uh, and binary-wise, then I created some fanciful letters uh, for, uh, for these since binary doesn't show up on slides very well. 
Um, so in this case, we have um, in this case we have a, a set of letters that are micro ops for function A and a set of letters that the micro ops for function B. And so we uh, shoved the two of them through Needleman once, and this is the output string that it got uh, between the two of them. And so if we could start looking at it, we just take all the letters that actually match, and those are the same between the two functions. And we take the sections that don't match, and those are the ones that we have to uh, enclose inside of an if, uh, an if then else or an if and else block, and then the rest of them that match um, come over there. So um, if we take a, if we take a look at that, where these two things are, it actually even tells us where to insert the if. Um, so as soon as we find a section where the letters don't match, then we say those are enclosed within the if, and the others, the, the original ones in the if, the other ones inside the else block. So, uh, um, uh, so if we uh, if we take these and we have if and if and elses, then we can actually start calculating whether or not it's efficient to insert this into the archi ar uh, the architecture. So if we actually know that inserting an if statement uh, costs us 80, uh, 8 bytes or sixteen bytes, then we can come over there and say here's the here's the full, whole function. This is going to take two ifs. If we merge the if we merge them together, um, do we have more than eight bytes uh, of savings between merging these two functions together? And we can start doing those. So if we can match functions, then we should be able to match entire sub-assemblies. So if uh, somebody compiled OpenSSL down for one architecture and OpenSSL down for another architecture, um, then we should be able to match the entire OpenSSL uh, subsystem between the two. And we can do that simply by running around and taking uh, all the, uh, the, the function graph. We can take all the leaf functions uh, that we have in the two, the two graphs and find the best match for every leaf function. And then we just recurse up and find the next best match for all the parents functions and all of those parent functions until we no longer match uh, below our threshold. And so in this case, um, we've got uh, we've got a subsystem of, of functions, and we can actually describe the the uh, distance between those two sub uh, those two subsystems um, as as an edit distance. Um, one of the things that uh, um, uh, one of the things that uh, this allows a uh, allows you to do then is as you're inserting the rootkit, you don't care if the vendor is actually changing the version of, uh, of the assembly in his target root kit. So if he's running the micro IP IP stack inside of his, uh, um, inside of his uh, firmware and he updates to the new version of the micro IP stack and I've got an old version inside of my, my rootkit code, then I can just come over there and say like, oh, just give me the best, uh, your best effort match as I insert you into the new, uh, in, into the new firmware. And so when I insert it into the new firmware, then it'll just be a less efficient insert. So now we can actually uh, go about uh, building, this, uh, building this rootkit. So we, we run around and we find uh, all the, the best match nodes uh, for, for everything that uh, matches. And anything that doesn't match the, the, that merging the functions together would actually make them bigger than the original function. Then we just add all those to the end. Um, and then, but we're still in the micro op language. So then we basically have to do all the things that a compiler normally does. We have to reverse the, uh, we have to take all of the, uh, um, the registers in the infinite register file, file, run them back through a register re reallocation language and assign them to registers. Then we have to reverse it all, moving up through all the optimization stages and eventually generate, a, um, generate assembly in our target assembly structure. Um, and so this is basically chapter three of most uh, compiler handbooks. Uh, so uh, we're basically running a compiler backwards at that point. So we get our, uh, um, we get our rootkit uh, all set up. And so the final overhead of, uh, of, of all this stuff, um, so it took about, uh, um, in my test case, it took about uh, 2,100 bytes to describe, uh, describe how to detect these waveforms and detect the, the, uh, the reflection, how to uh, um, spoof all the uh, sensor noise and all that stuff. And uh, the, so the, um, uh, oops, I have the I have a wrong number. So the uh, the original firmware was about uh, about 60k. The updated firmware is about 62k. So if we look at that uh, um, as uh, in terms of an efficiency, then uh, um, we took our uh, rootkit and we we shrunk it down by merging all these functions um, by about uh, um, by about 35 percent. So after all of the the work of matching all the functions and stuff, we made it about 35 percent uh, um, smaller. So um, the demo gods have not been uh, kind to me on, uh, uh, on this particular one. So uh, to actually demonstrate this out, um, I thought, ha ha, so, so what I'll do is I'll run out and I'll buy some, uh, um, I'll buy some uh, Modbus uh, um, serial to ethernet converters. 
And so this, these will uh, these all be great. So I went out and I bought uh, I bought three of these guys and uh, started poking at them. And so this one actually has a 186 in it, and the other two have uh, have some itty bitty little arms in them. And so all three of them. Uh, uh, all three of them actually have um, unauthenticated firmware upload, which I wasn't uh, expecting. I was thinking I was going to have to write some O-days to actually get the firmware to install on them. But all three of them, you basically just connect to a port and say, please take my firmware, and it takes the firmware. So the firmware updating part was, was actually really easy. And then I ordered a, uh, um, a high-speed scale. Um, and high speed scale didn't work at all. So there's like a half second delay between when you touched on the scale and you actually saw any, any change in the data. So it was totally crap. And so since I didn't have time to uh, actually order another high speed scale and get it here in time, then uh, I did the same thing that uh, all geeks do. And I went to Best Buy and I, ordered, uh, I bought a joystick and I put a spring on top of it and I made a scale. <laughs> so. Uh, um, uh, so I, I so I must apologize for my uh, uh, for my scale mechanics going on there. So in this case, um, I'm just going to pop over here, and uh, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. so you can see some of these uh, these algorithms in uh, in in action. So. Um, so on the top here, this is the uh, this is the signal off of my um, off of my sensor. So uh, you know, as I put pressure on the scale, take the pressure off, then uh, the scale looks uh, looks all nice and good. So this is actually the uh, the, the line matching algorithm uh, in effect as it's going on. So uh, in this case, I'm not exporting that from the uh, uh, from the microcontroller. I'm just uh, um, I'm just recreating the logic that's inside the micro my controller actually in it. So so if we go look at it, then this is the data part. So whenever we're looking at the data to see if uh, uh, stuff is going up and down um, in the appropriate uh, fashion, then uh, oh, as I uh, as I trigger my uh, trigger my detection as well, um, going up and down. And so then this is actually the noise generation. So this is the, uh, um, this is the native noise uh, uh, up on top of it. And then down here, then this is a computer generated noise just off of the top of the, uh, of the sine wave. So we've, uh, we've taken uh, via runs analysis and we've broken all of this down into its components. And then we're just randomly sampling out of the pools to generate this sensor noise. So, uh, um, so the primitives that we have are, um, are just the uh, the straight line segments that have been miniaturized and inserted, and the uh, um, and the sensor noise. And so from there we can uh, we can start extracting all of the uh, the artifacts that we need, and then generating any spoof that we want, whatever we want to show the operator. So. I couldn't actually bring a, a bunch of industrial control system stuff um, over here to, uh, to do demos with. So if you're kind of going to have a water hammer, then it's going to have to be a, a water hammer uh, uh, with a bottle of water. <laughs> so in this case, uh, we've got the, uh, the triangle matching, and we're going to turn the, uh, the line segments into triangle strips and then uh, try and extract it. But my spring here isn't actually very accurate. So, um, so uh, um, when it's uh, detecting this transient, I'm getting lots of false positives and, and false negatives. But in this case, we've got, uh, we've got it running down in just a couple of kilobytes of memory. And when I uh, um, drop, a, uh, a drop a water onto the, to the plate to simulate my water hammer, here it's just triggering it to start a spoofing routine. So at this point, it's detected the water hammer. Um, uh, it's uh, turned the, uh, the input signal that's running through this uh, little Modbus to serial converter. Over there, it's detected the input signal. Um, uh, turned it into a set of line segments, created a tri triangle strip, and then taken the ratio of those triangles and the triangle strip uh, to, uh, to figure out that I've actually crashed something on top of it. So if we crash it again, then it should come back. Although this has a lot of, uh, um, <laughs> has a lot of uh, um, false positives. And so now we're back and, uh, and, and everything's, uh, and the spoof is released and all, everything is going as, as normal. So in this case, we've got, uh, um, uh, we've got it uh, chunked back down, but uh, where I think we're, that uh, that we can go for these is um, um, I think we're about a year away from actually getting Metasploit for uh, Metasploit for firmware and industrial control systems. So since uh, I was able to do the insertion in such a in such a generic way then a lot of these devices reuse code, like tons of devices by the Square D DNP stack. 
and that's what they use to speak DNP3. So if they're all reusing the same code, then we should be able to make generic insertion routines that come over there and take the firmware out, break the, break, it, break the firmware down into a normal form, and actually do some detection. So if we take all the leaf nodes in our sample, um, our sample DNP stack, and we match them to all these leaf nodes inside the firmware, uh, firmware of the device, we can sit there and match them and get a percentage chance that this is actually um, this particular vendor's DNP stack or this particular vendor's Modbus uh, implementation. And so if this is uh, in multiple products across multiple vendors, we can just break it down and say, um, that match is 92%. I'm pretty sure that that's that particular vendor's, uh, vendor's stack. Then if we write uh, various rootkits and, and uh, we compile them down, or various components for, for detection and attack and, and things like that, then we can put those in a set, set of modules as well. And so uh, um, in that case, we can take a, take a firmware in, um, break it down and say, oh, this has this vendor's X, this vendor's Y, and this vendor's Z in a way that's a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more elegant than just like flirt signatures. Um, uh, come up on a console and say, um, okay, so since this has the, uh, um, this, uh, this one's using the micro IP IP stack, then here's my inserter, my injector for the micro IP IP stack that gives you hooks into the sends and receives and all the other fun stuff. Here's my payloads, crunch them down, um, run them through there and efficiently merge them into the, uh, into the target, uh, um, target firmware. So uh, I think we're probably about, uh, about a year and a half uh, before we do that. And so once we actually get there, we can actually then start testing um, industrial control processes at penetration testing speeds. We can go over there, we can hit a device, pull the device, um, come up with the attack, code up something really, uh, really quick, and shove it back in there, and have our entire time between looking at it, um, breaking it down, and seeing if uh, uh, seeing if the, this is going to work, Toro can actually test this. I think we can get this down into just you know 10 or 15 minutes from uh, from actual uh, firmware extraction to testing the scenario that we're uh, that we're up to testing. So uh, I think we'll get there. Um, so we're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of manual interaction with uh, um, with breaking down the firmware and that type of stuff. Um, but it's getting a lot more automated. So uh, with that, um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, so do we have any, uh, any questions? I think I, was, uh, I, I went through that one a little bit too fast, actually. But. So I've done a 